of psychology and pop culture had a baby, they'd call it shrink tank. A new paper reveals more intelligent people are quicker to learn and unlearn. 90% chance that there's some like, weird animal out there. Yeah. Alan Stern's been doing this forever. And far more extreme. From Nashville and Charlotte, this is the Shrink Tank Podcast. And welcome, everybody. If you're joining us for the first time, a very special welcome to you. If you're coming back for more, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Dave Verhagen here in Nashville. We have a great show for you. Our trending topic today is double standards in pop culture. We'll get to that in our second segment. But first, let's meet our Charlotte panel. And Dr. Emma Kate Wright is here. Emma Kate, how are you? I'm doing well, Dave. Hope you are. Doing well. So since we're talking about double standards, particularly between men and women, without talking about it as a gender difference, were there double standards in your own family growing up? Oh, sure. I was the middle child, um, and I also am from a blended family. And so there are lots of dynamics between um, step-sibling, step-parent, all of that jazz. And um, even just speaking from, you know, being a middle child, my younger sister, she got away with a lot more than I did, for sure, hands down. And Dr. Frank Gaskell's with us. Frank, welcome back. You're back from the dead. I, I'm almost back from the dead, but yes. So you had a bad case of the Ebola. I had Ebola, and then I went to L.A. with you. Can I, and, uh, can I comment on this L.A. trip? First of all, how, yes. how, was, how was your L.A. trip, Frank? I really like California, except there are too many people, and Thanos needs to visit that area. But I will never go there again because the jet lag has destroyed me. Well, let me let me just sort of comment on this. I know that people uh, are not going to be terribly surprised by this. But when I first saw Frank, he had landed and he told me how everything about California creeped him out, that he flew <laughs> over, there were too many people, that at the hotel or resort where we were staying for this conference, that the tile on the pool was wrong. It was the, wrong. That the cliffs went into the water and that shouldn't happen, that there were sharks in the water. Yep. That there was, and it was like he couldn't stand being there. And then right. like... Two days later on Facebook, he's posting like, great time in <laughs> at the name of the hotel and love it and all this stuff. Do you know what sent me the over the edge? I, it was I, two I, I things. I wanted childhood? to send you over the edge. Well, I know. You always want to send me over the edge. It's two things. It was the falconry hawks that flew 260 miles an hour and, and the wait, World wait, wait, War... They did not fly 260 miles an hour. They didn't while we were there, but when they hunt, they hit 260 miles an hour. They're the fastest falcons in the world. I don't think it's 260 miles an hour. Dude, I've looked it up. It's true. Oh, my God. Did you look the it up guide, on the internet? No, oh the my, guide told oh me, God, and then I researched Dave. it over the... For, for, whatever. And Dave. they hunt in pairs. The second thing was the, the P-51 Lightning that flew past me so close that I about jumped out of my skin. Is that a plane? That's a World War II airplane. They had a World War II airplane show. But it wasn't going as fast as the Falcon, like a bird could have, could have beat it. So let, let me just set the scene for you here. We're staying in a very nice hotel resort on the coast. There's like, we, you walk down to the jetties, there's nice water, and it's like a beautiful place with a spa. And what Frank likes is the bird's and the airplanes that have it's nothing to do with the, the place we're staying. It's called a Peregrine Falcon, and it hits 245 miles per hour during its dives. All right. It's ironic that the thing he hates is jet lag, but he talked about a jet being one of his favorite things <laughs> that turned him around. Hmm. It was not a jet. It was a World War II airplane okay. propeller. Yeah, he's right, because I had friends growing up. I would like up, to so add something he before we move along. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, you can't see this, but if everybody in the room got a U-turn ticket in L.A. and said, I didn't see any U-turns, and then went back. And there weren't one, there weren't two, but three U-turns at that intersection. U-turn signs, right. Who, who could signs be that, that said, Signs that said, don't U-turn here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I got pulled over, and the cop said, um, did you see the no U-turn sign? I said, I promise you, I did not. And she wrote me the ticket, and then I went back just to do a little recon. <laughs> and from the time you pulled out of the place where the restaurant was, 
to maybe like a hundred feet to where the turn was, there was no less than three no U turn signs. And if you went down further, it was like maybe a dozen of them. Like there's just <laughs> that never ending no U turn signs. Did so. they say, Dave, this one's for you? No, seriously, Dave, look up. <laughs> <laughs> You're just getting sharper with age, man. You're like cheddar. And, um, and in the back seat of the car, I was driving a family around. It was a mom and a dad who were at this conference with us and their two kids. And the cop was asking, first of all, they made me like, you know, kick somebody out of the car and then come back and pick them up because there are too many people in the back seat. So that was a hassle. But they asked the kids all the questions that you would ask if you were suspecting human trafficking. You know? <laughs> oh, my God. It was all the... How do you know the man who's driving the car? <laughs> has he ever t- has he ever touched you in a in appropriate oh. way? It was, yep. Yeah, I was like, wow. I'm in California. I'm being suspected of human trafficking. Ooh, you look like a pedophile in California <laughs> and all 49 other states. Yeah. <laughs> so got that going for me. Well, you just heard him. Jonathan Hederley's here. He's our certified Asian. He rounds out the panel. And Jonathan, I want to ask you if you had any double standards in your family. I had so many double standards growing up. I'm the youngest of four, but at one point I was responsible for doing all of the yard work and on lawn maintenance versus my older sisters. And then the other was like my dad and his girlfriend, they could walk around naked and have sex in the living room and smoke pot and sell pot. But I don't think (laughs) I would have been able to do that. That's huge double standard in my family. I really feel like I was neglected as a child. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's sad. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about double standards. All right. Well, each week, Jonathan trolls around the internet, and he finds a great story of psychology in the news for our first segment that we call Being Human. A new case study reports swimming in cold, open water may help those with major depressive disorder to gain control of their symptoms and possibly live medication-free. Now, this study was led by a television doctor out of the University College London and co-authored by two University of Portmouth scientists. Portmouth? Portmouth. Portsmouth. And it highlights the case. (laughs) Portmouth. Stop. (laughs) Portmouth. It's not Portmouth. It's Portsmouth. 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 Portmouth. (laughs) It highlights the case of a woman with severe anxiety and depression who, once she began swimming in the open water, immediately started to feel better. She continued to swim, and as the weeks went by, her symptoms of depression and anxiety faded to the point where she was able to stop taking her medications entirely. Two years on, she remains drug-free and is still swimming. So, Frank, as our resident expert in using cold water to treat certain things, what do you make of this one case study? I would like to see it replicated. But I think theoretically it makes sense, especially the last portion of the article when they talk about sort of, I'm going to not say this right, but swelling, uh, inflammation of the body uh, can lead to a variety of issues. And you throw yourself in cold water for a while, it reduces inflammation. Uh, it also and swelling. Redu- yeah. It reduces a stress response. <laughs> and they see yes. it as more like a, a, a biological way of responding to a stressor that can sort of protect a person, improve their mood. And I will tell you, I, have, I haven't I have done cold water swimming, but I did a thing where you get in a hot tub and then you jump in an ice tank and you do that back and forth. And I swear, when I was done with that, I felt like a million dollars, but I did not want to do it again. <laughs> you, would, you would know what it feels like, a million dollars. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know what it feels like by, to be paper. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm in agreement. I think it's an interesting um, case study. Like Frank said, I mean, it is a case study, so it's just one individual. So it would be nice to replicate this with others. But, um, you know, our understanding of the relationship between depression and inflammation is in its infancy. And there are a lot of other things that are coming out in terms of just inflammation being related to mental health issues like schizophrenia. I saw a recent article about that. So I'll be curious to see, um, as more research is done in this area, what, what comes about. Well, if you have questions or comments about this, we'd love to hear from you. You can write us at feedback at shrinktank.com. Any questions or comments, send them our way and we'll respond. Let's go ahead and shift gears to our trending topic today, which is double standards in pop culture. In particular, double standards between men and women. We know there's lots of double standards kind of across the board in business, in almost any realm. 
of uh, human life, human existence, um, across not just in our country, in our culture, but across cultures. But I wanted to ask you guys first, um, do you feel like there are some glaring examples in either sports, or music, or movies, TV, anything pop culture related that has been sort of a notable double standard in the last maybe month or, or, or summer or so? Emma Kate, any thoughts? Oh, yeah. No, there was that highly publicized issue with Serena Williams where um, essentially she got you know, heated over a call that a referee made where the ref was saying that she was being coached. And so then she got a point taken away, which is a really harsh penalty. Um, and I guess it's I, even that confuses me, though, because it's like, why do you have a coach if you can't be coached? But anyway, um, so she got this point taken away and then um, she got mad again and broke her racket. And I guess she lost. Was it a game? Did she lose a game? Which is a huge penalty. And of course, this there was this whole uprising of people afterwards saying that this is just something that doesn't happen with men in the sport of tennis. And it's just, you know, you can think about it with other sports in general where where, you know, if a woman is really heated, she's hysterical and she needs to calm down versus the way that men are talked about. It's passion. Um, you know, they're they're heated. And so, you know, you don't think about refs talking about LeBron James when he gets pissed off about a call saying that he's hysterical. Yeah. A great example. Frank. Well, <clears throat> this is an observation and maybe a question, too. In tennis, women have to wear these little skirts. Men don't. And in women's volleyball, they're basically wearing nothing. They're like Tommy John underwear for men. Mm -hmm. And men aren't walking around there out there in thongs. So like, what's that about? And why like I I'm I'm fairly astounded that that's still a thing, that that hasn't changed. And and I don't know if you guys have any understanding of why that is, but it freaks me out all the time. I mean, my impression is that a lot of things are male driven. And so they think, oh, well, no guys are going to want to come to watch females play sports. So let's put them in some skimpy outfit and see if that draws a crowd. Mm -hmm. Do you ever hear anybody complain about it? Uh, probably not men. <laughs> but I'm not hearing women complain about it. You don't I, listen to women. Yeah, I don't think you listen to us. Oh, wait. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not just sports, though. I think about that with film where um, – like Wonder Woman recently with Patty Jenkins, the female director, one of the things I was so impressed about was that the Amazonians, the female warriors, actually had protective armor that covered their bodies versus wearing some sort of like little skimpy metal bikini. Hmm. Skimpy okay. metal bikini. Yep. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, any example? Well, to kind of piggyback off of what Emma, Emma Kate was talking about, I think Really in film, especially there's a double standard because whether it's with women or um, minority groups, like each film has to prove that there is a market for that film to be successful. So you put a lot of pressure on films like Wonder Woman or the upcoming Captain Marvel in terms of superhero movies. If you have a film like Crazy Rich Asians, that these are tentpole movies that have to prove that a marginalized demographic, um, w it can be successful. When you think about the, all the films that are written, directed by men starring a predominantly male cast, that they don't have to prove that. They're allowed to just be creative and, and find a unique story and a creative way to tell that story in film rather than if one of those bombs, it proves that a, a movie that's centered around men can't be successful. Yeah, I, I just want to throw these stats out. This is from 2011, um, but I doubt it's a whole lot different. Women are 17% 17, 17 of all executive producers, 13% of all film writers, 7% of film producers, 2% of cinematographers, 20% of op-eds and newspapers, 3% of creative directors in advertising, and 3% of all clout positions in media. So women have zero voice. Yeah. And just to pick one of those, last year was the first year ever that a woman was nominated in the best uh, cinematography category. Like there, there's never been a, in the history of film until last year, there's no, no woman ever even nominated as far as I know. Um, so that just kind of makes the point. It, it's like, 
that that's not something that most people would be aware of. But then when you hear that, you're like, that makes no sense. Absolutely makes no sense. Um, I'm surprised you guys didn't talk about the uh, Kavanaugh hearing. Um, What's that? I know. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Brett, <laughs> Brett O. Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh? Yeah. Brad. You, you mean Bart O. Kavanaugh? <laughs> hey, Bart. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, um, so he comes back to defend himself, and he is sort of like mad as a hornet and spitting and and crying and and yet if a female had done that it would be she is this hysterical unstable woman but for him it's like he's kind of portrayed as this uh passionate tough guy and that people are the commentary is like that's even what Trump wanted was they wanted this guy to come in and sort of be a fighter. And so he's coming in there and he's getting scrappy and it's portrayed as this sort of passionate scrappiness rather than this mental emotional instability. Emma Kate. And, and conversely, she actually, the way they talked about her, it was almost like, well then, so she's so calm. Why isn't she more upset? And so it's like, no matter how she was to respond in that situation, she's getting criticism. Right. If she was, if she was, more emotional than she's an right. emotional woman if she's more calm and even tempered than she's, she's a liar she's, she's a not liar the truth. right mm-hmm. but here's the thing trump's latest polling when he he blasted ford all of his numbers uh the people who are are believing kavanaugh and saying nothing matters are white poorly educated rural people and so that that's the voice that we're hearing. And what's going to be I, – I was thinking about this this morning about this November election and what that's going to look like. And I, I almost imagine it a party atmosphere of all of these people who didn't vote and all these, these women that are like, you know what? Hell no, I can't take it anymore. And they just rush these polls. But – these these voices of well you know he's he's fiery and i believe him those those are that's just trump base come on you guys come on he likes beer okay i mean don't you like <laughs> beer have you ever liked beer okay maybe he had a little too much to drink one or 12,000 times have you ever had too much to drink i'm not, <laughs> if you <laughs> okay. if you just listen to that audio and don't look at him he sounds like Kermit the Frog. I mean, okay, so maybe <laughs> I like, he blacked out. I like beer, out, Senator. But... I like beer. Have you ever had beer, Senator? Have, have you guys ever not blacked That's out it. and not remember it? Yeah. No? <laughs> and the internet won. And the sniff a lot. There's this great video where they splice that commentary with Quentin Tarantino film. I still like beer. Mm. You mind if I have some of your tasty beverage to wash this down? Sometimes I had too many beers, but I did not drink beer to the point of blacking out. <sighs> And I never sexually assaulted yes, anyone. Yes, you did. Yes, you did, Brett. He is warm, friendly, unassuming. He's the nicest person. I don't remember asking you a damn thing. Well, um, let me give you one other example. This is from the past when I used to work in radio. Believe it or not, this the, almost every station I worked in, there was a an edict, particularly if it was a top 40 or similar kind of station, that you could not play two female artists back to back. No kidding. Wow. And wow. that would promote lesbianism, right? Right. Mm-hmm. right. I mean, in, in fact, when they got more computerized and the playlists came out and you know, you, you pretty much didn't have a lot of say in the order, it would the the algorithm or the or the program would do the same thing. It just wouldn't put female artists back to back. There was this sort of um, conventional wisdom that no one could ever point to any data about. It was just sort of a given that everybody accepted that people are going to turn the channel if they're two female artists back to back. Weird. I feel like one thing that we haven't, just because we've talked a lot about females here, when I was preparing for today, one of the things that kind of came up was um, in film, have you guys ever seen the movie Horrible Bosses? Mm -hmm. So Jennifer Aniston in that film it's kind of interesting so she is one of the horrible bosses and she is even on the promotional material for that film um posed as a a man eater and so basically in that film she takes photos with her employee while he's like passed out and she is an extremely attractive person obviously and so because you know oh well she's hot you know if the roles were turned 
on that where it was a woman that had photos where a man took those photos and she was passed out, it would be an extremely different situation. And so I know you guys are all men, so I'm just curious like what your thoughts are on that. That actually happened to me once. What? Yeah. You became um, a man? But it was my best friend and, and another friend taking photos of me, uh, maybe a thousand photos uh, passed out. Hmm. And I, I felt loved by it, to be honest. But that was because he was my best friend. When I said, "Have you ever blacked out?" Frank raised his hand and said, "Why? Why? Yes, I have." No, that was. <laughs> oh my god! That was, that was when I used to drop loon. No, but but seriously though, because the only reason why in this film it came across as though it wasn't okay is because he was engaged and he was happily in that relationship. Otherwise, I feel like the standard theme or dialogue that guys would have would be like, "Oh, that's awesome that she, you know, put her boobs in her face or whatever." And so it would be this very positive thing. Do we really sound like that when I, we talk. I feel like sometimes guys do. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could go on and have lots of different examples, but I think we've made the point that probably across the board, sports, business, politics, music, movies, etc., there's a double standard with men and women. So let's get into the psychology of, of this. Why is that still the case? We're, we're, we're still seeing women underrepresented in film. We're still seeing uh, the, the kind of bias toward women in politics, in sports, what what's driving that psychologically, do you think, Emma-Kate? I feel like it has to do with power and authority as well as discomfort with change in general. As humans, we're creatures of habit. We like to um, predict stability, even though really nothing is stable, as Frank would know. Um, but so, you know, it's just one of those things where I think we like to keep the status quo because that feels comfortable and people who are in power want to stay in power and maintain that sense of authority. Well, I have. Okay. So let me, let, let me agree with that, but also say women represent 50, 51% of the population. Mm -hmm. Why, why is there no, I mean, I know there is a groundswell in politics and so on, but what, what keeps if, if you think just from a number standpoint, what keeps women from pushing harder? Or do you think they are pushing as hard as they can? I think we are pushing. I think you have to think about the historical background of all this. I mean, we didn't have rights to vote until this you know, past century. And yeah, I think we've made a lot of progress, but I think obviously there's more room for that. And then there's also things happening where I don't know if it's the right answer. Like, I don't know if you guys are aware in California now, they just changed some of their laws about requiring a female to be on any executive board. And and so then is it, you know, are women going to actually get there because they feel like, oh, man, I did this and I earned this? Or is it just, uh, oh, they have to fill this slot because I'm a woman? Frank, any thoughts about the psychology of it? Yes. So slaves were freed in the 1800s. We're still 250 years past that. They've been held slaves since the 1500s. So if that institution's been around for 600 plus years, it's going to take a long, long time to undo it. And it's not even just being free. It's the right to vote in the civil rights movement. That was just 40 years ago or 50. So we have a long way to go. Women have been men's slaves for thousands of years. And the ERA movement back in the 70s, that, I mean, this is still new. And we need the old guard to die out. And we need better education among young people so that we're a better educated electorate. And I think this Me Too movement has powered people. But, but this is a, another generational shift. And uh, it's cleaning out the mess. It's going to take probably another... 70 or 80 years. Mm -hmm. You think that long? Yes. Jonathan? I mean, both of them make some really solid points. A couple things that immediately came to my mind was Emma Kate and I, about a year or two ago, were on this panel at Heroes Con and it was debating, you know, um, progress for women in, in pop culture or film. And we were put in this position where we had to argue that there was enough progress. It was terrible. It was, it, yeah, it was v very difficult. But the, the fundamental argument for that was like, we've made a lot of progress, be, be happy with it. Even, and I think that that's probably a, a sentiment 
But that's probably how a lot of people believe. It's like you've made progress. Stop complaining and whining. Like we'll get there. They don't want to accelerate it versus once, you know, they're nowhere near being equally represented or given opportunity. They're also put in a no-win situation. And I think Emma Kate alluded to this in terms of the the bill or whatever you were mentioning in California. It's like if you get put in a position of power and authority, people are going to second guess. Are you window dressing? Is that because um, people have to? Are you the token female on a on a board or something like that? Or a podcast? Yeah. Or did you genuinely, is it your merits that make you qualified for that? And I think there's there's a lot of people that are able to see past that, but there clearly is a demographic or a, a percentage of the American population that maybe don't outwardly say it, but but inwardly think like she got that position because of her looks or because they need a woman rather than just assuming, making the assumption that her qualifications and intelligence makes her fit for that power position. So let's stick the landing on this thing. And let me ask a question about how to accelerate this or move this forward culturally. Let's just take the example that, that Emma Kate said, not even getting into women representing in different jobs and roles in Hollywood and that kind of thing. But so how do we get the attitude shifted where a, a woman who is passionate, angry, um, has an emotional outburst is not, um, thought of or regarded differently than a man in the same sport, for example, just like is what, what helps that move along faster culturally where people just don't, they don't have those same assumptions or those same preconceived notions. Any thoughts about that? I, I do actually, I think, um, I mean, there's strength in numbers and having this hashtag me too, but also, it's really strange culturally, generationally for me. I, I'm like almost 130 years old. My daughter's only 15. And looking at her Instagram, she's posting things about Dr. Ford. She's talking about women sticking together. And at least at her school, the culture is that. They're, they're, if, if guys act differently, they're just pounced on. Uh, so I, I think that's part of it is strength in numbers and social media helping along with it, but also enlightened teachers and parents to foster that. Yeah, I think it's going to be about education. And then Frank is speaking to that sort of generational divide where, you know, a lot of these issues have been in place for hundreds of years. And so it's going to take time, unfortunately. And we're going to continue to push. Yeah, I think you've said enough on that. But thank you. Oh, okay. So you're <laughs> quieting my voice. Yeah. Thank you. That's okay. <laughs> That's but okay. That's, I don't even know what to say. That's okay. I'm, I'm just, I believe see, we should this protest. Is, I'm just like, okay, I'll be quiet. Okay. Um, no, I'm but, sorry. But now, but no, I just get distracted. Dang it. Um, no, but so basically, what, I don't even know what I was saying. So we're done. All right. you were, right. Let, let me done. help you, Emma Kate. You were speaking okay. about education. I don't want your help. Um, no, but so, yeah, I really don't know what I was saying. And that. Jonathan. All right. <laughs> wow. How do you follow that up? Um one area of special interest that I have is teaching this young generation of boys about respecting women and um, developing a sensitivity and having a healthy outlook of women in authority and in power overall as well as in their lives. And I think that that really, um, I think this generation of adult men need to step up and really help boys see that. Because one of the challenges that um, I see in, in my work as a therapist is like um, a, a lot of boys at some point, they just start to view their mom as kind of like nagging and excessive and overbearing. And I, I see a lot of husbands, I see a lot of fathers like throw the wives under the bus. It's like they, they perpetuate that that outlook. And so... For, for men to, of every generation to really start to view them as capable, uh, allowing them the full range of emotion and that that's not a sign of weakness. If anything, we need to help boys express emotions better so that they can understand when women express their emotions, it's not a sign of weakness. 
I'm with you. And in, in fact, in the last month, I've had the chance to speak to all to all boys uh, prep schools. And next week, I'll speak to fraternity guys at Vanderbilt. And that's one of my passions as well is to help those guys think differently and to and to be challenged in some of their assumptions and biases and that kind of thing. So I think those of us who have the opportunity to talk to to boys teenagers, young men, uh, we have opportunity to really reshape some of that as well. Well, if you have questions or comments about this conversation, we'd love for you to write us at feedback at shrinktank.com. Please let's hear from you and tell us what you think about this very important conversation. Let's shift gears to our final segment that we call our doctor's orders. These are things that we're personally enjoying in pop culture. Emma Kate. So I am a big fan of the creepy, spooky stuff, and now we're in the month of October, which is awesome. And there is a fantastic podcast called Dr. Death that I just binge listened to. Um, It's terrifying because it's a true story and it could actually happen to anyone where um, it goes through the terrible medical procedures of this one neurosurgeon in Texas, Dr. Christopher Dunch. It is awesome. Check it out. Jonathan. This past week was the one-year anniversary of Tom Petty's death. And if you go onto iTunes or other music streaming services, they have released a deluxe uh, compilation of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. It's called An American Treasure. It's 60-plus songs of remastered versions of some of his classics, a lot of live versions of his songs, and then outtakes that you can't find anywhere else. Highly recommend it, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, An American Treasure. I feel like I make this recommendation twice a year, but I'm going to do it again. The new season of Survivor's on. I love it. Uh, the The season started off strong. The very first episode, they had to airlift somebody out of the show uh, by helicopter. And so it's like they've had like a monsoon. They've had all kinds of crazy stuff. So uh, it's still not too late to jump in on the new season. It's just a few episodes in. So the new season of Survivor. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Shrink Tank Podcast. We hope you'll check out shrinktank.com for great articles and videos and also links to our Doctor's Orders products. You can also follow us on Twitter at shrink underscore tank and please like us on Facebook. For questions or comments, drop us a note. Our email is feedback at shrinktank.com. If you like the show, please give us a review on iTunes. It really helps build our audience, and we'd greatly appreciate it. Our producer and theme music composer is Sean Beck. Our associate producer and social media guru is Mariel Butler. For Emma Kate Wright, Jonathan Henderley, and Frank Gaskell in Charlotte, I'm Dave Verhagen here in Nashville. Tell all your friends about us and make it a great week. Thank you.